And I love this song because no matter where we're at, we have a reason to praise. So let's do just that. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. that doesn't put you in a mood for Thanksgiving, I don't know what's going to do it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Go ahead and tell somebody around you what you're thankful for.
forget to grab your communion and fill out that connection card for us. Praise is rising.
have ever fight and ever will fight belongs to the Lord and if you fight what better way to fight than on your knees because he can he can intercede for us and he will if we ask him so let's lift him up this morning in prayer and a sense of praise for everything that he does for us God we thank you for who you are and what you've done on the cross the many battles that you won in my own life, I can only express a sense of gratitude for what you've done for me and what you continue to do for me. And I know I'm not alone in this room. I know there's many of here, many here who have fought bigger battles than I and have seen you at work in it. And God, I just want this morning to be an invitation for us to surrender. And rather than try to take things head on by ourselves, we actually get down on our knees and ask you, to fight our battles with us. God, we love you. We thank you that you are that kind of being. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we'd like to uh, welcome you into Crossroads. If you're uh, here in person or if you're joining us online, we're glad that you're here with us today. Uh, I've got to make a confession before we uh, get going any further. Last night, I took Amelie, my uh, nine-year-old, who went to the uh, sporting soccer game. They were playing St. Louis. It was a sold-out crowd, you know, really super loud in there. And according to Amelie, I had plenty of things to say to the officials. <laughs> And this is what you've got this morning. So uh, you'd think, we went to games a lot last year, they're always Saturday nights. You'd think I would have learned, but here we are. So uh, you get to listen to this uh, all morning long, so you're welcome for that one. Uh, and it probably didn't help that once again, Sporting blew a lead late in the game, and so she said I had a few more things to say, not just to the officials, but then also to the team. So, um, you know, sports, what are you gonna do, right? Hey, we're glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, we're in week three of this series called Let's Talk About It. And uh, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, if you haven't watched online or, or listened to them yet, we're in this series talking about big, heavy things. Uh, things that are very real in our lives, in our culture. Maybe they're things that you're dealing with yourself or you have dealt with in the past. And if not, maybe something you will deal with at some point in the future. But it's things that we have to talk about. Things that we just can't ignore or, or pretend aren't there. 
And if we're going to talk about anything as Christians, we need to learn how to talk about it in a way that honors the Bible and glorifies God. Uh, The last couple of weeks, we've talked about the topic of trauma, healing from pain and dealing with that. Last week, Caleb was here and he talked about uh, the messy grace that that goes into reaching out to the LGBT community. Today we're going to look at a topic that is one that's very, very personal for a lot of people. Uh, It's the topic of infidelity, unfaithfulness in marriage, uh, and then the forgiveness that kind of comes on the backside of that. It's a topic that I would say probably affects almost everybody in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're somebody who has been cheated on by your current spouse, by a previous spouse. Maybe you're somebody who cheated on your spouse. Maybe you're somebody who cheated on a previous spouse. Maybe, you know, you haven't, but your parents did. One of them cheated on the other one. Or, or you've seen it somewhere in your circle and you've seen it do damage to marriages and even damage to yourself. And you have to kind of ask, what do we do about this? This is a topic that isn't something that's just new in our culture today. I mean, this is a topic we're going to see in a minute. It goes all the way back to biblical times because this is one of the commandments. It goes all the way back to almost the very beginning. But I feel like in our current culture and society, we've kind of reached this you know, Babylon type of society where it's like a lot of people are just saying it's okay now. And maybe because, too, the way the world is now with the digital connection we have all over the world, it's never been easier than it currently is as well. Uh, several years ago, I, I came across uh, th- this company. I saw an advertisement on a, on a TV show of all places that I, I honestly had to stop and look at it again because I thought it was a joke. I, I thought it was one of those Saturday Night Live fake commercials. You know, they're usually pretty funny, and then I realized this one's not funny. This is actually, you know, a real thing that's going on. And I kind of hesitated to even show this, but I'm going to show it quickly. But it's this company called AshleyMadison.com, this website. If you're unfamiliar what AshleyMadison.com is, it's a, it's a website, it's a dating website for people who are married. The whole purpose is to help somebody find somebody else on the side. And in their commercial that they showed, it showed a man and a woman, uh, and, and it wasn't a graphic commercial, but they were very quickly moving into what you could tell was going to be a very intimate moment. And the voiceover said, this couple is married, just not to each other. And as you can see, their tagline is, life is short, have an affair. That's what they thrive on. Their founder, Noel Bitterman, uh, justified his, his position in founding this website by saying, in my opinion, monogamy is a failed experiment. Now, Noel Bitterman and his wife very publicly stated they were in a monogamous relationship. They were very committed to one another. Neither one of them ever wanted to look outside of their own marriage but yet they created this website. And the wife said, it's not personal, it's just business. Noel did make a comment that actually is kind of true. He said, we don't provide people with the desire to have an affair. They come to our website because they've already made that decision. Well, he's not wrong, but he's giving them a running start into one and making it way easier. Uh, As of a couple of years ago, this website has over 80 million users 35 million of which are in the United States, the majority of which are men. What's fascinating is about eight or nine years ago, hackers got into the Ashley Madison website and held for ransom a list of names of all the people who were subscribed to it. And you're not going to believe this, but one of the names on that list was Noel Bitterman, the founder of this website. And we laugh because you could say, well, he got what's coming to him. But yet at the same time, when it all settled, a marriage was destroyed. And that's the tragedy here. All the way back in the Ten Commandments, number seven says that you shall not commit adultery. And in every single translation of the Bible, it is as clear cut as that. You shall not commit adultery. And yet we see it time and time again. And I, I looked over several different websites this week trying to get statistics on this. They're all over the place on how many people have one. One website said by the age of 40, 60% of men will have one and 50% of women will have one. That seemed high, but 
Other websites were, they were all over the place on the stats. It's so hard to even keep up with and track, probably because the people who have done it aren't going to admit it. But all, either way, infidelity is year in and year out one of the leading causes of divorce. And the thing we have to realize today is that every single thing about infidelity is based on a lie. Everything about it is based on a lie. Lies that we tell ourselves, lies that we believe somebody else has told us, maybe something like, you're just my friend, or it's not gonna hurt anyone, or it's just sex. There's no physical, or there, there's no emotional connection there, or nobody's ever gonna find out. It's these lies that we tell ourselves. I'm just going to make a, a statement on this. This is, this is my thought, my belief. You can believe what you want to believe on this. I think Satan wants nothing more than to destroy marriage. He wants to bring us down, yes, but I think marriage is his number one target with that. Here's why I say that. Marriage, as we're going to read here in just a minute, it's more than just coming together and saying, this is my wife, this is my husband. To become one, Paul writes, to become one flesh. Marriage rips that apart. I don't know if you remember back when you were uh, kids, we used to do the, uh, in, in youth group, we would do like the, the duct tape, um, you know, experiment. Put two pieces of duct tape together, now rip them apart. You know what happens? Well, they don't look as neat and clean as they did when you put them together. They're more wrinkled. Okay, now go stick that to something else. Guess what? It doesn't stick as well. We, we would do that visual, and I loved that because I loved duct tape. That was kind of a fun experiment for me to do. Because, you know, as kids, what would we always do? We'd catch that one unsuspecting dude and put one across the back of his leg or something, you know? We were super nice to each other back then. <laughs> I think Satan wants to attack marriage. And I think Satan wants to attack marriage specifically with infidelity because it does two things. The first thing infidelity does is I think it's the easiest way for Satan to inflict pain on one of us. If you've been cheated on, you're going to understand this. The pain that comes with that is different. It's pain that says, I'm not good enough. It's pain that says, I'm not good looking enough or attractive enough. It's pain that says, I've been replaced. I wasn't wanted and maybe it's actually this, maybe it's pain where to try and justify things, it's, it's a lie that you tell yourself, I'm partly to blame. You ever get to that point? It's pain. And because of that pain, the second thing it does, it can cause you to trust God less. Now, what do I mean by that? Marriage is about trusting your spouse. And if you're like me, you believe that marriage is God's gift to us, then you believe your spouse is God's gift to you. And if you can't trust that person, you kind of can't trust God. Kind of the same idea of, of maybe you, you know somebody who's walked away from the church. And they walked away because someone hurt them. And therefore, God hurt them. This kind of works the same way. I can't trust this person, so I don't know that I can trust God either. Here's why this matters so much and why I think this is, this is where I'm coming from here. In Ephesians 5, Paul writes this, this, this great passage about husbands and wives. And as he's coming out of this verse 31, he says, for this reason. Let me back up just a moment here. Because the verses before this are very well-known verses, especially for married, married couples. If you've gone through marriage counseling, premarital counseling, you've probably heard this. Maybe some pastor even decided to say this in a wedding one time. But guys, what's our favorite verse in the Bible? It's Ephesians 5.21. You know what it says? Wives, submit to your husbands. And then Paul writes nothing else after that, right? Like that's, that's the end of the Bible right there. We have that on our wall in our living room, just wives, submit to your husbands and nothing else that comes after that. I'm making that up. You know that because I'm still married standing here today telling you that. No, wives submit to your husbands, and then he explains why. And then he says, husbands, love your wives. And wives are like, well, that's not fair. I have to submit. He just has to love me. No, you read on. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? Enough to die for her. Enough to lay down his life for her. And in light of all of that, here's what Paul says. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one, one flesh. And he says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ 
in the church. Here's why I think marriage matters so much. Marriage is the closest earthly representation we have to God's love for us. It's not our kids. And your kids are part of you. We've got three kids. You hear about them almost every week. And I love them dearly. And they matter to me more than almost everything on the planet. I say almost because there's one person that matters to me more. And that's my wife. And I try to make that clear to them. Hey, you guys have a high priority in, in our lives. Your mom comes first. Jesus comes first and then your mom. Well, let's, you know, let's get that order straight. My relationship with Jesus comes first and then it's your mom. But too often, I think we lose sight of that. Every time I'm asked to do a wedding, uh, that's the very first thing that I say when the, the, the bride has been walked down the aisle and everybody's still standing and it's, it's the husband and the wife or the, the, the groom and the bride and the dad are still standing there before they're even seated, before the dad even sets down. I say this, marriage is the oldest institution on earth. It's the oldest thing that God gave us. It predates any government, any kingdom, anything. It's the oldest thing that he gave us, and it matters to him because he wanted us to be able to experience what his love for us is like, and this is the closest representation we can get to it. And divorce breaks that. Infidelity cheapens that. What I want to do today is a little different approach to this because, I mean, there's just no good way to approach this topic lightly. But it's a sermon we can't dive too deeply. This is kind of that awkward in between of this entire series of, I think I've said each week, I could make this a series of itself, but we've got one sermon to put this into. So what I want to do is look at ways we can protect ourselves. Ways we can put things in place to avoid getting into that situation and then kind of come back at the end and talk about what happens or what, what do we do if it's already happened? So the first thing we want to look at is, is how can we avoid having an affair? I, I think there's two, two major steps here. And I think we've, they, they both require a lot of honesty on our part. The first is you have to admit your vulnerability. You have to admit your vulnerability. We are humans. We are flawed. We have weaknesses. And whether you know them or not, you have an enemy that does. You have an enemy who knows where your weaknesses are. And I think one of the worst things that we can say, men especially, but ladies, you too, one of the worst things that we can say that's not honest is an affair could never happen to me. Because the minute you say that, you're putting out a boast that you can't back up. When you say it could never happen, it could. Here's why I know that. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I don't know if you're like me, how many of you like to watch like nature documentaries? Um, you know, especially the ones where there's a predator sh- creeping up to pounce on some kind of a prey. Anybody else sick? And Okay, no, just me and one or two down here. Okay, yeah, just a couple in the back, great. I've got a few people, that's good, that's good. I love those. And anymore, they don't really even show the kill anymore. It's like, what, what did I just watch 10 minutes of this for? You're not even going to show the good stuff, right? <clears throat> How many of those do you watch, especially if it's like a lion, you know, or some big cat that's just their expert hunters, and they see prey off in the distance, and they just take off on a dead sprint right across the field, roaring loudly, going all the way to it, and they get their kill. It never happens that way. It doesn't happen that way. No, what do they do? They creep in slowly, quietly. They lie in wait. They're patient. Even when they're hungry and starving, they're still patient. And they wait maybe for one of the herd to kind of get separated from the pack or to kind of get off on the edges just a little bit or they find one that they know is weak and can't outrun them. And they creep and they creep and they wait until that animal lets its guard down. And then they pounce. And once they pounce, it's over. That animal's not getting away, at least not getting away anywhere close to how how he was before. Guys, the enemy's not going to come right up to you. Guys, let me just blow any preconceived notion out of your mind here, no matter what you've seen in a movie. The enemy is not going to come up to you 
in the form of a very attractive, scantily clad woman just saying, here I am. Probably not going to work that way. Ladies, you're not getting Channing Tatum showing up at 930 from Magic Mike. It doesn't work that way. (laughs) Why? The enemy knows you're on your guard for something like that. Also, number two, let's be honest. Guys, look in the mirror. They're not coming like that, okay? Let's just be honest with ourselves, right? No, what's it come in like? From the sides, slowly, quietly, from behind, until suddenly the enemy's right behind you and has you within his reach. You have to admit your vulnerability. So what do you do with that, number two? You have a plan of defense. You have to have a plan of defense. Uh, the Chiefs just won back-to-back Super Bowls, and yes, Patrick Mahomes is great, Andy Reid's great, Travis Kelsey's great. No, they won because they've got the best defense in the league, now two years in a row. You, you guys can remember those years they had a great offense and no defense. What happens? They make the playoffs, and they don't go very far. Uh, I, I've seen that with teams in every sport. Defense wins championships. What's our defense? It's learning to look for the lies from the enemy. That's who he is, by the way. John chapter 8, Jesus calls him like this. He says, when he, the devil, when he lies, he speaks his native tongue and language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Did you get that? Lying is his native language. But here's the trick with the enemy. He doesn't just come up and lie to you by saying, hey, uh, the, the sky's yellow. Like, you can look at it like, no, it's not, it's blue. No, he's going to twist just one little thing here. He's going to take a truth and change just one little degree of it to where it's not fully the truth, but it's still kind of the truth. If you don't believe me, go look at what he does with Jesus. Jesus, when he's tempted, the enemy comes to him, the devil comes to him, and he quotes scripture to him. Almost. He changes like one word. Well, Jesus is Jesus. He picks up on this. Can we? I mean, are, are we in tune enough to be able to sniff out the lie here that, that the enemy is throwing our way? Because it's not just that that he throws our way. The enemy likes to tell us things that then we believe. Here are some common lies I think that we tell ourselves that can lead to ultimately the wrong decision. The first one is this. We're just friends. It won't hurt to spend time with this person, specifically this person of the opposite sex. We're just friends. We're just friends. Guys, that's dangerous. Because maybe you are just friends. Friendship can lead to something more. Friendship can lead to something deeper. It can lead to more than just laughing at each other's jokes. It can lead to connection. And then those feelings that you claim aren't real actually do become real. So what's a defense mechanism for this? Don't be alone with somebody of the opposite sex. It's not part of your family. I mean, there's sometimes... In a work situation or a work scenario, sometimes things are unavoidable. Put layers in place. That's one thing we have on on staff policy here is we won't be alone with somebody of the opposite sex. In a pastoral role, sometimes there has to be some degree of a counseling session where there has to be some level of privacy. We have windows in our offices. We put things in place that make sure we're not compromised with this. We don't travel alone in vehicles with somebody of the opposite sex. Again, that's not part of our family. We make sure that we are doing what we can to avoid anything that might possibly be out there. The second lie that we tell ourselves is it's harmless to have a digital conversation with somebody. Maybe you've been on a different angle of this. How many of you have read a text or read an email and you think the person is angry and they're really not? Just because they're direct. We always say it's really hard to convey emotion through a written message. You tell yourself that it's very hard to convey connection through written message, but in reality, it's actually a very slippery slope because that digital communication, it's quiet, it's secret. You don't have to put the risk of talking and somebody might hear you. And with certain apps on your phone today, that conversation can disappear an hour later and leave no trace It's a very dangerous road that you can go down. Let me just tell you this. Secrecy is the enemy of intimacy. So guard yourself against this. How do you guard yourself against this? Well, if you've got to have a conversation with somebody of the opposite sex, make sure your spouse knows about it. Either loop her or him in on it. 
There's a lot of conversations that uh, I'll, I'll show Jennifer, I'll tell Jennifer, hey, you know, so-and-so text me, this is what it was. You can look at my phone and read through them. Protect yourself. Here's the third lie we tell ourselves. Pornography is private and it won't hurt my spouse. I'm not going to dive too deep because this is next week's topic. And I will tell you, it's going to be pretty PG-13 because there's really no way to talk about that topic and not be pretty PG-13. We're going to talk about porn and we're going to talk about kind of this cheapened love that we have in society today and how we've just, anything goes, right? So I'm not going to dive too deep into this one today, but we will talk about it next week. But I want to throw something out there about this particular topic that I'll hit on more next week. Not just you married people, but you single people too. I know there's a lot of you in here who are single. I want you to start running something kind of through your mind here. What if somebody was recording your phone or your computer all the time and then showed it to your future spouse? Is that something you want him or her to see? Is that something you want him or her to have rolled out there for everybody to see. Start protecting yourself now. Start protecting yourself today before that person even comes into your life. You may say, what do we, what, what do, we do with all this, these lies that are coming our way? Well, I do agree that defense wins championships, but sometimes I think the best defense is a good offense. And one of the best things that we can do, one of the things that I've, I really try to make sure it is solid in my own life, what are the right things that I'm doing to help protect from the wrong things coming in? Because I believe that if you're running towards Jesus and you're filling your bucket with the things you should be, the enemy is not to say he can't get in, but he's gonna have a lot harder time getting in. So what do we do? Three things, this isn't exhaustive, but three things we should be doing regularly. First, read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day. Get in the word. <clears throat> I have found in my own life the times I am most susceptible to the enemy. When I look back and I'm honest, I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not spending time praying like I should be. I'm not, not chasing after God the way I'm supposed to be chasing after God. And I know that can be very common for so many of us because we think we're good. I've read through it. I know the Bible. I go to church. I listen to worship music in the car. <laughs> we think we're good. No, keep doing it. You might remember back last, last uh, spring, we finished the transition. I went through my, my personal core values. My number one, we will relentlessly pursue a deeper and more transforming relationship with God. That's my number one core value in life. And I hope it is for you all as well too. Read the word. Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, go back to the enemy Tempting Jesus with scripture. Jesus called him out because he knew what the scriptures actually said. He knew what the word of God actually said. With social media today, it is so easy for somebody to post what looks like scripture. It's really not. Do you actually know what it says? Are you following? Are you tracking? Put it in your heart. The second thing that we can do to build up a good defense is surround yourself with godly community. This is so important. Again, when you watch those nature shows, who is it that the predator picks off? It's the one by himself. It's the one who is off by himself. It's usually the weak one, the one that's injured, the one that's hurt, the one that is, is sick. They don't go for the one in the middle of the pack. Why? Because they're smarter than that. Your enemy is going to have a much harder time getting to you when you're surrounded by good, godly community. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We use this verse to encourage church attendance. But it's more than just here on a Sunday morning. Small group, uh, ladies' table groups, guys getting involved with some of the activities and, and building community there. Accountability comes with that. Surrounding yourself by godly people in your office, if that's at all possible. Not isolating yourself. Again, when I look back and I find times that I have been the most vulnerable, I have been isolated. And whether that's because I did it myself or because I let somebody else kind of isolate me. That's just what happens. 
Put yourself in a community. Get involved with a small group. Get involved with a, a Bible study group or, or one of our ministry teams that have a community aspect within them, a family aspect within them. Number three, if you want to build a good offense to build a good defense, this is, this is my favorite one on the list here, don't stop pursuing your spouse. I will tell you, for me, this is something where my intention has been better than my follow-through. And, and part of that is just the season that Jennifer and I are in. We're in what a lot of you parents understand, that very busy season with kids. In fact, we're going straight from church to a soccer game this morning. I probably won't yell as much as I did last night. I hope not, because I don't have the ability to. But this has kind of been life the last few months, and we joked kind of going into March, well, we'll see you in June. But yet, I told her the other night, I said, I really want to go on a date with you. And then, uh, I don't know what day it was, um, sometime this week, Thursday, Wednesday, she texts me from work. Uh, I got these recommendations. It's two Italian restaurants. I said, are you asking me on a date? (laughs) She said, maybe. (laughs) And we have a hard time always making that happen. Uh, That's on me. You know, that's not, we just got to make it happen. Make it a priority. We can let every excuse possible get in the way, but I don't want to stop pursuing my spouse. What did I say earlier? I make sure my kids are clear on this. Your mom, your mom's above you guys for me. And so even if it's just 30 minutes a day, we try to at least take some time together to sit and watch a show, to sit and talk, to sit and do whatever. We won't go any further than that. Never stop pursuing your spouse. You chase and pursue your spouse your eyes stay on your spouse and not on what the enemy is trying to distract you with. Don't stop pursuing him or her. Here's why this is important. When you build a good base of offense, you're building a fortified foundation that the enemy is going to have a harder time getting into. But here's the flip side of that. I heard this quote this week and stuck with me. It's impossible to build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. And too often, that's where we are. Not to say that our lives are just full of sin, but we're not chasing the things that do bring us closer to God. Therefore, we're filling it with whatever we want to fill it with. If you build a foundation that is on Christ, that is looking like Christ, man, the enemy may not even mess with you because he's going to have a very difficult time reaching you. I said earlier that We've got to be careful not to have that vulnerability or or, or admit that we have a vulnerability and not just make a bold statement. Well, this could never happen to me. I'll never forget this quote. One of my friends, he's a Bible college professor. He's He's a pastor, a preacher, said one day, talking about marriage, he says, I can say with 100% certainty that right now it'd be impossible for me to cheat on my wife. The key words there were right now. And he went on to explain that. That wasn't an arrogant boast on his part. What he was saying is, I'm doing all of those things. I'm in my word daily. I am surrounding myself by godly people. I am pursuing my wife every single day. He goes, if I lose any of those things, you know what? Suddenly that 100% number might drop because now I'm open. I'm available for attack. He uses that threat and that vulnerability as a personal challenge to himself. Guys, we would be wise to do the same. We would be wise to do the same. But what about those of you who it's already happened to? What about those of you who are maybe coming through one or there's one in your past? Maybe it's a previous spouse. Maybe it's your current spouse. Maybe it's something you're dealing with right now. Let me just say that I'm about to answer this in just a few minutes. This is something that marriage counselors will have you spending weeks with, (laughs) have you spending a great deal of time with. But there's just a couple of simple things to approach this with. And let me start by saying the simple answer is that there's not a simple answer here. So what do we do if you have been on either side of an affair? The first thing is if you're the one who was the offender, you have to seek repentance, and work to regain trust. And it's on you. It's not on the other one. It's not on your spouse, it's on you. You need to get as honest as you can, as quickly as you can. That's hard for us, why? Because anytime we've done anything wrong to anybody, 
our defense mechanisms kick in, our self-preservation kicks in, we blame others or we try to leave some details unsaid because we don't want to look worse than we already do. Be as honest as you can as quickly as you can. And the other thing too is when you seek trust, know that that's not on your timetable. That's on your spouse's timetable and you've lost the right to demand that trust back quicker than you're gonna get it. You've gotta be patient and show day after day after day after day after day why you should get that trust back. But again, if you're the offender, it's on you. Don't let your spouse take any blame for it. Don't let your, your spouse take any of the credit for it. It's on you. What if you're the offended here? If you're the offended, this is where it's really hard because at some point you just have to practice hard, messy forgiveness. You have to offer that. And I, I say that not just because, you know, that's the easy answer here. No, that's the essence of the Christian life, offering forgiveness. Last week, Caleb talked about that, that love is the balance and the tension between grace and truth. That's, that's our lives. The truth is what's right or wrong. That's black and white. The grace is how we accept people for failing to meet that. The, the, the truth is Jesus went to the cross because sin required a punishment of death. The grace is that he did it himself and he didn't make you do it or me do it. We have to offer that same forgiveness to somebody else here. Grace and mercy, it's difficult. And we're supposed to do it even if the other person doesn't show any remorse or repentance. I think of it like this. I try to put myself in Jesus' shoes sometimes. What I mean by that is when somebody's done something to me that's hurt me that I don't really want to forgive them for, I have to ask myself, wait a minute, didn't I do the same thing to Jesus? And didn't I do it multiple times, not just once? How many times have I ran around on him? How many times have I cheated on him? And how many times has he forgiven me? His grace is sufficient, and the Bible says that if you ask his forgiveness, he is faithful and just to do just that. I think sometimes, though, we convince ourselves that if we forgive somebody of something, that we're in a way saying that it, it didn't really happen. Can I, can I just tell you, that's not necessarily the case. Forgiveness isn't telling yourself that what happened to you doesn't matter and that you shouldn't feel hurt by it and that you shouldn't have some pain by it. Forgiveness is simply just learning to let it go. I heard one time, forgiveness, or, or not forgiving somebody, holding on to that hurt, holding on to that pain, it's like drinking poison while waiting for the other person to die from it. It's just going to eat away at you and erode what's inside you. But folks, forgiveness is more than just something nice to do. It's biblical. Matthew 6, Jesus says, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Forgiveness, especially when it comes to marriage, is key. I remember uh, when Jennifer and I first got married, I was teaching high school. Uh, she was in nursing school. And so we didn't have a whole lot of money. So our, our honeymoon, it's the honeymoon of a lifetime. Uh, I don't want, I, I hesitate to say this because I don't want to make anybody jealous when I say this. So remember the Bible says not to covet. We went to Branson for like two days. Then we tagged along with my parents uh, to Colorado for a church trip. This was our honeymoon. Uh, we went ahead and took off um, to Colorado a few days earlier, and we spent some time with her aunt and uncle. I hadn't met her uncle Dave yet. I'd met her aunt Chris. Um, but uh, we were sitting down at dinner, and we'd been married like two weeks, and uh, I'll never forget what her uncle said to us. And he was just talking about his parents and how they talked to him and, you know, things he's tried to put into play in his own marriage. But he said, we've made the decision to never go to sleep angry, at least not with each other. He goes, we've gone to bed mad, but we don't go to sleep angry. And that's something that we've tried to really practice. And I don't know how many times we've laid in bed, upset at one another, 
fighting sleep till we can get this resolved. I'll be honest, usually it's my fault. <laughs> I know that shocks you, but normally it's my fault. I heard that really loud laugh over here. <laughs> and without looking, I knew who it came from, so. <laughs> Forgiveness is the essence of marriage. It's the essence of relationship. No matter how big or small, the indiscretion. A lot of times we've upset one another simply because we've said something the other one took out of context or heard wrong. Forgiveness is the key. But so too is admitting that you're wrong and seeking that repentance and seeking that trust. I truly believe, guys, marriage is God's greatest gift to us. Outside of Jesus and the salvation that we got, the marriage relationship, the love that we share with somebody we're committing to, that's his greatest gift to us. Value it, treasure it. I have people all the time that will say, well, Kurt, this isn't my first marriage. They're like, great, make it your last one. Plus, one of, one of the two of you passes away, make it your last one. Commit it to God. Give it to him. And understand what that spouse means to you because what that spouse means to God. And protect it and treasure it and fight for it because the enemy wants to destroy it. Let's pray. Father, Father, we are so grateful that you give us just a taste of what your love for us is through marriage. God, I pray today for the husbands and wives across this room and online. God, as husbands, you would put in us the, the fight to fight for our wives, to do what it takes to lay down our lives for them and protect them. For the wives, you would give it to them whatever they need to fight with us and for us as well too. And that both husbands and wives would realize we're one. We're one through you. God, anybody who has dealt with the pain of infidelity on either side of it, God, touch hearts. For the offender, God, soften their heart to repent, to restore. For the offended, to forgive, to let go. God, and for all of us, protect us from the enemy. Protect us from the lies that we tell ourselves that the enemy says are okay because they're no big deal. God, we're so grateful. You are perfect. <laughs> Help us as we strive to become more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Good morning. We come to that time in our service where it's appropriate to talk about the subject of love, in particular, God's love. And a question that uh, uh, comes to mind that I think is appropriate for us to spend a couple of minutes reflecting on is the question, how has God shown his love to me? How has God shown his love to you? And if we were assigned with a sheet of paper and a pen to, to start listing down answers, we probably would have uh, some uh, different answers. There'd be some unique answers in there, but there would also be some answers that a lot of us would have the same. For example, one of the things we would probably put in that list is through creation, God has shown his love. You know, we can all, we're in that time of year now where, where uh, maybe we're gearing up for um, the vacation that we were planning during the winter that's going to be taking place here in a couple of months. Maybe when school is out or something or other, you're going to go on a trip. And, and part of the fun of doing all of that is the reflecting on previous trips. And some of the most inspiring ones as far as beauty is concerned. You know, we, sometimes you go on a vacation and whether you knew it was going to be this way or didn't know it, you know, you're just inspired by the sheer beauty of what it is that you're seeing. You know, whether it's majestic mountains or, or whether it's a waterfall or whatever it might be that, that is really uh, capturing your attention. 
And uh, so, yeah, that would probably make a bunch of our lists that God has shown his love through creation. Another thing that would come to mind is through his provision. You might use different terminology here, but it's the fact that, that God has always provided. Oh, you may not have been eaten every year of your life, every month of the year, ribeye steaks. You know, you may be like Kurt talks about a time that they went through when they were short on finances. I think all of us have been there. And maybe you're there right now. But yeah, there were stretches of time that uh, the meat selection uh, was pretty short list. Bologna. And that was about it. And that was back when bologna was cheap. Now I don't know if that would even make the list. Um, but the fact is, I didn't have to have an empty stomach day after day after day. God has always provided and maybe you feel that way too, so maybe that would make the list. Maybe another thing that would make the list is answered prayer, especially the miraculous kind. You know, I think uh, here, uh, Rob, I think of you uh, with your brother Richard that went into the hospital a couple weeks ago and the prognosis was really serious with a tumor on his neck and they had to start a trach and and the doctor was like 99% sure this was a real aggressive cancer, and it was inoperable. And we got a bunch of people praying here, and I know you outside the church got people praying as well. And, and then uh, a week or so ago, the, the report that came back is, is it's not cancer at all, and it's already started reducing in size. And, and Rob is the very first one that attributed that, well, I mean, maybe Karen did, but, you know, I was talking to Rob, and he attributes that to a miracle, answered prayer. So, yeah, maybe that would make the list of how God has shown his love. Maybe the Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be on this list, but what's the main thing? An old apostle, he was the only one that lived long enough to become old, John, he wrote this in 1 John 4. This is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we could have life through him. This is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us in sending his son to be the way to take away our sins. That is the ultimate demonstration of love on God's part to us. All the other things are valid and should be on the list, but that's the top of the list. During this time, while you take the bread and you eat it in the cup and you drink it, reflect on that. Now what that represents, the cross and what happened on the cross, that represented God's love at its riches and it's directed toward you let's pray father thank you for loving us more than we deserve thank you for not waiting for us to take the initiative but you took the first step and in a convincing fashion demonstrated your love thank you lord for loving us so much that you would make such a huge sacrifice on our behalf. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Well, as uh, we said a couple of weeks ago, it's always a good service when you get to end it in swim trunks. Um, yeah. This is, uh, this is Logan. Uh, Logan is part of our Crossroads Kids. He is nine. He's decided he wants to follow Jesus. And so we are excited about this. He's been asking about this for a long time. His family is up here on the front row. Uh, some of them are in tears. You think we can make them all cry? No? Okay. I thought, I thought you'd be up for that. So He said he really wants to cannonball in. We're, we're debating that, but uh, we're just going to, I think, do it the old-fashioned way. So, Logan, what I'm going to do is just ask you to repeat after me, and then we're going to go down in the water, and, and we'll get baptized. Say, I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And I accept him today. And I accept him today. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. And I commit to follow him. And I commit to follow him the rest of my life. The rest of my life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for days like this. We're grateful for decisions like this, especially with the next generation making their declaration to follow you, God, and to be faithful to you in baptism by taking part in your death and burial and resurrection, by showing everybody here that they want to follow you as well, too. God, I pray for Logan as he steps out of the water today and begins his journey with you, Lord, that you would guide his steps, you would guide his, his heart and mind to follow you. God, help us as a church to come alongside and help him on those, those days and that journey as well, too. We're so grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great way to end our service this morning. And, uh, uh, but I'm going to try to top it. And the only thing, <laughs> and the only thing I can think of doing is making some announcements. All right. <laughs> I do have a couple of announcements, but this certainly won't top that. Um, we got, got some things. You read a lot in your bulletin about this or on our website. But the, the Blended and Blessed um, conference is this coming Saturday. You can still register for this. Um, and, I mean, this goes hand in hand, uh, par partially with uh, what Kurt was talking about in the message today. You know, if, if uh, there's been a divorce in your life and there's children and then a remarriage and what a, a great opportunity this this conference would be, but it doesn't have to be divorce. It could be a death, maybe it happened to a spouse, and then a remarriage happened following that. Anyway, this is a conference that is scheduled for this Saturday. You can register um, online. You can even do it on the back of your connection card that you'll be turning in when you're walking out the doors. That's this Saturday. Uh, another thing is we're calling this Spring Clean is also on Saturday, we have three work projects that are scheduled. You can read about that in your uh, bulletin as well. And, uh, um, and we ask that you designate which one of these that you and perhaps some family members want to be a part of. Uh, how many family members, we need to know that. You can register online uh, for that or, again, on the connection card. But that's this Saturday, whether it be overgrown brush, helping with that, some landscaping, or scraping and painting the exterior of a house. or several projects. You can read about those and, and make a pick as to which one you want to help out with. The third thing is prime time. That's 10 days from today. On May 1st, uh, Ben Sanders is going to be ordained, and uh, there's a biblical precedent for some of this. We'll explain it that night um, at that. Ben will have an opportunity to talk, but there will be a little bit of, 
little bit of teaching as to what the Bible says about this. But also, on Wednesday night, there's going to be an opportunity for us as, as a church family to uh, be praying for Ben and Kelly with the task that they're getting ready to to uh, do at God's leading and go into South Dakota and, and uh, the starting of a new church. So anyway, all of that's going to be happening at prime time. It starts at 6.30 that evening, so I would encourage you to come and be a part of things here. And the last thing I want to plug is just this is men's ministry as a whole. There Now that Spring is in full force, and summer's right around the corner. Uh, there are several additional men's events regularly being scheduled. We've had some all through the winter, but now, now there's some additional ones uh, cooperative with the weather. And we want to encourage you guys in here to, to get plugged in and, and uh, have some enjoyment with brothers in Christ. Uh, of course, I want to plug the cruisers. They had their first chili ride yesterday, but uh, uh, it kicks off a season where if you've got a motorcycle, you're newer to the church, we have a church group um, that goes on local rides and also goes on two and three day multiple rides. Email me and I can give you the whole schedule on that. Actually, it's on the website too. So, all right, let's go ahead and stand up and now that I have miserably failed in trying to top that, we will have a prayer, okay? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to spend some time looking at your word, knowing full well that the difficult subject matter that uh, was being touched on today uh, is something that you hit head on in your word. And we're thankful for that, Lord. And help us to have ears to hear and diligence applied in our own marriages. Father, we love you and we thank you for first loving us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, have a good week. If I could have just a few volunteers to help with the baptistry lid, I'd appreciate it. Have a good week.